Well, the numbers have astounded me. I mean, I, I was thinking we might have 100,000 by the time we launched the game in September. You know, I thought we might get maybe 10,000 in the first week. The fact that we're at half a million, you know, in a couple days is, just blows me away. Uh, it's uh, kind of really interesting because I think people are really enjoying the creation process without even any goal direction or game around it. And that's one tool, you know, that we have in the game out of about eight. You know, so I think once people will get that full suite of tools, uh, I can't wait to see what they do with them. Well, when you play the game, you find that depending on how you've designed your creature, it might be a really good fighter, it might be very stealthy or very fast, um, it'll drive you to play the game in a totally different way, you know, based upon how your creature is specialized. And how you play the game, you know, whether you're being very aggressive or very social, has an impact, you know, in terms of how the next levels unfold. So I think people will be kind of surprised that maybe this thing that looks cute and cuddly in fact ends up being this voracious carnivore and they end up being a militaristic society because of this cute little cuddly thing they designed uh, without noticing the fact that they were picking you know, very strong weapons for it and fighting feet or whatever. So uh, I think it's going to give people a totally different spin on the content. Um, but really I, I didn't want that to overpower the aesthetic choices either. So we were trying to strike a really interesting balance between functional decisions of what parts you put on the creature and aesthetic decisions that I want this to look like a zebra. And getting that balance, striking the right balance there, uh, you know, we'll find out once we release the game. Well, I think there are like two dimensions to Spore that are uh, probably the most clarifying way to describe it is on one dimension, it's about this epic journey from single cell to colonizing the galaxy. And that gets the powers of 10 side of it. The other side of it, which you're kind of seeing now, is that every part of the game wants to feel like a creative endeavor. Um, that the player, in fact, is kind of creating this world. They're creating the creatures, the buildings, the cities, the spaceships, the entire planets at some point. And so I think it's really the balance of those two things, you know, this kind of epic theme from very small to intergalactic, and this idea that the player can creatively control every aspect of the game. Even if they don't design everything that they're seeing in the game, they have control over the stuff that's being pulled down from other players by subscribing to their buddies or sportcasts or whatever. They can even shape the world around them that they're not controlling. Well, yeah, astrobiology, in fact, was one of the big inspirations for Spore. Uh, the fact that, as a subject, astrobiology hits all the sciences, you know, in almost equal amounts. And I wanted Spore to be that kind of vast perspective you get if you step away from biology or, you know, uh, sociology or economics or, as, you know, astronomy. And imagine all these things as this one cohesive whole, which they are. I mean, our universe really doesn't distinguish between geology and, you know, climatology. We do that. These are artificial distinctions. And so, for me, that was one of the overarching goals of Spore, was how do we look at the entire environment that we're embedded in, you know, and get kind of a, an interesting, you know, overview of it. The social networking uh, was, you know, considered to be a very light kind of part of the game early on. You know, as we started getting into development, we started seeing the cool stuff that people on the team were making. And we started having fun, just kind of organizing the content. And I love the stuff this guy makes, or I love these airplanes over here. It became obvious to us that we wanted higher level tools for kind of organizing, sharing, collecting this data. And if you look at, you know, what's the model for that that people understand, a lot of the social networking features like buddy lists and things like that, uh, is, it's basically a language that people speak. And you can speak in those terms to them, and they understand what it's like to kind of collect, organize, and distribute metadata. Uh, so the social networking side of things really became the language that we picked up to use as an overlay to describe the set of meta features on the game. I think user-generated content is one aspect of a larger thing, which is uh, user-driven experiences. You know, I think games you know, more and more want to let the player drive the experience to a deeper and deeper level, and it might be content that they're creating, but it also might be narrative. It might be theme, it might be aesthetic. I mean, it could be a number of different things. And it doesn't necessarily have to be them, you know, making it. It could also be them selecting it or steering it. But I think uh, the games are inherently this malleable experience. And as we see more open-ended games, more sandbox-type games, really what you're doing is you're allowing the player more freedom to, you know, kind of craft their own experience, you know, to have a say in it. They're co-authoring this experience with us. So I think this is just kind of the tip of a larger iceberg. Sports had like two major challenges through the whole project. You know, one was technical. Uh, we had to basically solve a lot of hard technical problems that nobody had solved before on procedurally generated content, 
on uh, usability, making these editors extremely easy to use and fun to use. Uh, so that was, you know, kind of the engineering side of the challenge. On the design side, uh, you know, we were dealing with a game that's mixing all these different genres and trying to present it as a unified whole, you know, fairly consistent feedback, control schemes, goals, missions, etc. Uh, so there was a huge amount of design effort that went into, you know, prototyping, building these levels, reformulating them. You know, it's kind of like you have these five different pegs and we're trying to get them all even. As soon as you push one down, this one pops up and you hit that one, that one pops up. You know, we have to keep going back over and over, kind of evening it out, smoothing it, smoothing it, you know. And that was very much a design iteration challenge. And so those were like the two major challenges we faced. I think it's better if it's specialized in some ways. Um, you know, on the other hand, I mean, our real issue is bandwidth. You know, I'd like to see Spore in a lot of different formats, you know, even outside of games. Uh, you know, we have to make sure that we kind of execute on the things that we, you know, choose to do well, though. Um, we're right at the cusp of launching this as what I hope will be a major franchise. And last thing you want to do is shoot yourself in the foot by trying to grab too many opportunities right off the bat. You want to execute really well on the things that you decide you're going to do and really follow through. Um, and that way, the other opportunities will come naturally. Uh, you know, if you drop the initial ball, then the other ones, you know, it's kind of pointless. They're uh, irrelevant. Oh, it's gonna, Sport's gonna ship on September 7th, uh, worldwide, and I feel wonderful about that. <laughs> I've been on this project for many years, and it's about time to uh, get it out the door.